Hey everybody, before I get started, I just wanted to mention a couple of ways that you can engage with me on a more personal level. I have a few avenues set up and I keep focusing on one and I figured, why don't I make a short little video talking about all of them real quick before we get into these uh, episodes. So first thing, Patreon. There's a link in the episode description and every episode description to the Patreon, as well as uh, a video on the feed called Major Announcement that has all the details of what each tier offers and how much they cost. I implore you to check that out. I offer a lot of cool shit for my patrons. Uh, second thing, the Discord channel. There's also a Discord link in the episode description and in every episode description. I have multiple channels set up there for each show that I'm covering, and it's a great way to just engage with me. I have a channel set up for... Uh, uh, MMA talk as well. I'm a big MMA fan. So if you're an MMA fan, you can check that out as well. There's a link to the discord in the episode description. And then lastly, oh, the Facebook and Twitter, social media, follow me on there. I post news on there. When I say news, I mean like, hey, I'm stopping covering this show. Hey, I'm starting covering this show. Let me know what you think about this. I do uh, live watches of things on Facebook where like I'll check in and say, I'm watching so-and-so show. And then I'll like live comment while I'm watching it. And that'll be cool if maybe you watch that show too and you want to watch along with me or you're watching it later and you'll see my thoughts, which are usually pretty entertaining because I'm usually pretty high when I'm writing them. So uh, check out all those links in each episode description and let's talk about this episode. Peace. One mic, one mic. Yeah. All I need is one mic. One mic. Yeah. All I need is one mic. One mic. Hey everybody, welcome back to One Mic. And today I'm here to talk about season one, episode eight of FX and Hulu's Shogun, entitled The Abyss of Life. An interesting choice for a title, as this episode, at least to me, uh, seemed to mostly revolve around loyalty. Uh, the idea of life being an abyss seems mostly relevant to Mariko, who just can't seem to find the right timing on when to die. <laughs> this was... Uh, Yet another great episode that I think only serves to, to underline the fact that this show is performing at an incredibly high level right now. It seems destined to end in phenomenal fashion. Like I said last week, the criticisms I had of this show uh, in the first few episodes are gone. And in their place are tighter narratives, uh, stronger performances, and scenes of cultural tradition that I think serve to not only just showcase the culture at this time, but also to further the narrative. You know, the concept of loyalty, loyalty really drives this episode for me. Uh, what does that mean to Tornaga? What does that mean to, to his generals? What does that mean to Blackthorn? You know, these different ideas of loyalty are, are immiscible, and they, they set forth a chain of events that are going to pit allies against one another, and likely result in these final two episodes being pretty fucking good. So uh, this one, this episode, opens by immediately, immediately telling me how wrong I was <laughs> about the impact of Nagakato's death on... Uh, on their surrender. I was confident last week too, man. Like, surely Toronaga will blame his brother for this and everything's gonna go go left. Well, we don't even see his brother in this episode and Nagakato's death didn't change much of anything. Uh, they're still headed to Osaka to surrender. It did change one thing though, pretty important thing. It bought Toronaga time. Uh, he, is for, he gets 49 days of mourning before he has to report to Osaka. Now, if you're anything like me, which I'm certain you're not, <laughs> you thought 49 days, that's a pretty arbitrary number. How'd they land on that instead of a rounder number like 50 or two months like 60? Don't worry, guys. <laughs> I looked it up for you. Uh, reading directly from the AI generated search result that I got, here's how they arrived at 49 days. Quote, in Japanese culture, the 49 day period of mourning or goreizen is a time when offerings are made to the deceased spirit, such as flowers, that's the deceased, like deceased apostrophe S, like the dead person, uh, are made to the dead person's spirit, such as flowers, condolence money, or other items. This is because Buddhists believe that the spirit remains in a certain state for 49 days after death, and that prayers for the deceased are said every seven days to help them pass into the next life. The 49th day is also when a celebration is held for the mourners, as the spirit is said to arrive at his destination and the attention turns to the living, end quote. So really it just revolves around the number seven. So, <laughs> uh, every seven days a week, they say prayers to help pass this person on to the, to the afterlife. And they do that for seven weeks, AKA 49 days. So it's just something, just the importance of the number seven, which is persistent throughout history and through all different types of cultures, seven's important everywhere. And this is just another example of how. So that was a long roundabout way of, of learning that seven is important to the Japanese too, just like it is here in America. 
So, moving on, Blackthorn is finally granted his wish to leave after having asked 89 times. Uh, he's given back his journal, and once they get to Edo, he's, in theory, he's given back his men. Uh, he doesn't need to go to Osaka, especially since he's not really loyal anyway, given that little mini tirade he had uh, during, well, when Toronaga announced his surrender last week. Uh, this is the first of many moments in this episode where loyalty in general and specifically to Toronaga is underlined. And he, he draws a line in the sand that says, you're either with me or you're against me. I also like the look that Toronaga gave uh, Blackthorn after he offered his, his thoughts and prayers. <laughs> gives a fuck, uh, about over Na Nagakato. The look is kind of, he looks at him like, you know, don't try to be nice after all that shit you talked at the meeting last night. <laughs> so I really like that look. It's like, no, we're not going to play games here. So once they get to Edo, there's a great scene where everyone except Toronaga is sharing memories of Nagakato and giving their opinions on his general uh, mindset and behavior. Buntaro, of all people, says some surprisingly nice things about Nagakato before Hiramatsu talks about how foolish and how reckless he was. And, and just, this is one of those episodes where I bet if you watch it again, you're going to notice a lot of clues that point toward what we learn at the end. Hiramatsu planting this this little bit of shade toward, uh, uh, toward Nagakato and thus undermining uh, uh, Toronaga and his, 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 who he is and his plans... That kind that already now that looks a little bit different, doesn't it? You know? So as I move through here, we're gonna kinda like talk about some of the things that kind of like are clues to what's going on. So then Omi chime, chimes in with disdain for the circumstances that led to Nagakato's death and for Toronaga as well. He, again, gassed up by Hiromatsu in this moment. Omi, who's been wearing his 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 displeasure all over his face uh the entire episode to that point takes that opportunity to to uh, prop up Nagakato, say that he died for something important, unlike uh, Toronaga is about to do, and just, you know, just generally shitting on Toronaga. Uh, this conversation, plus Toronaga becoming ill, plus disapproval among his ranks, prompts Yabushiga to propose that rather than going to Osaka to surrender, they roll up there looking for a fight. Now, we've seen all season long how Yabushiga has been playing both sides, going back and forth. And in an episode that really focuses on loyalty, again, this is a common theme in this episode, he's a lot more wily and unpredictable than ever, waiting to see how things will play out before he makes a decision or changing his decision if the circumstances no longer suit him. Uh, I'd argue that in life in general, that's a wise way to move. But in this culture where loyalty is above everything, there's no room for circumstances changed and now I'm doing something else. You're either loyal to Toronaga or you're not. And the circumstances don't matter and Yabushiga is not loyal. Uh, we also learned that Yabushiga is going to go to Osaka immediately, not waiting 49 days, to deliver Toronaga's guns and cannons to Ishido, which is part of a uh, condition of his surrender. Now, I want to take this time to, again, highlight the value of the cultural aspects of this show. You know, last week I talked about how uh, learning various aspects of their culture has enhanced our viewing experience. We now understand more clearly why characters behave in certain ways to the point where we can sometimes predict or expect certain behaviors. This is the same thing that Reservation Dogs did really well. And we see it here again at, at multiple times in this episode, but right now in this funeral scene for Nagakato, we see, you know, all the tradition... Uh, of, of how that looks. Again, uh, comparing to Reservation Dogs, they had a great funeral uh, funeral uh, episode as well, funeral scene within an episode as well. So seeing, you know, something like that, seeing how different cultures uh, send, the dead on, send the dead on to the afterlife, I, I just find it interesting. Uh, and then we have this great tea scene as well with Buntaro and Mariko a little bit later on, which we're going to get to in a moment. And there's beauty in these rituals. And, and that alone, I think, is enough to make these scenes valuable. But they also help us to understand the characters more as well. And that's, I think, where the true value is. For example, we learn in the funeral scene uh, that it's a show of disapproval for Toronaga's generals to be wearing their armor to the funeral. So later on, when Toronaga angrily points this out among other signs of disloyalty, that scene works a lot better than it would have if we didn't know what all that meant. Because he's like, yeah, I see the motherfuckers wear armor to my son's funeral. I'm like, okay, whatever, right? But like they established that that matters. And then the tea scene, such a great scene. So let me rewind for a minute and go back to the scene where Buntaro originally requests to make tea for Mariko. I already thought this scene was effective because it showed Buntaro in a different light. He feels broken, 
uh, now that he seems to understand that not only has he not broken Mariko, but he's pushed her more toward Blackthorn. He, like, he almost seems like, he almost seems meek in this scene. Like the one, the other woman in the room, she tries to leave. He's like, no, 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 you, you don't need to stay. He seems very, I mean, you don't need to leave. Seems very humble. Like someone who just wants to win his wife back. Uh, and, and, and that's relatable, right? To any, to any man. Still, when he asked to prepare tea for her, I thought of it as, as a mere gesture. Like, uh, granted, it's an, it's an important gesture because it shows him uh, being willing to humble himself and, uh, and not, ironically not behave like a barbarian, <laughs> but still, uh, just a gesture to me. Like, I, I didn't think the tea, the actual making of the tea in and of itself was important. I thought it was just him humbling himself uh, before her. But then we get to the tea scene and I'm like, oh, him offering to bake tea isn't the same as if I offer to bake my wife tea. <laughs> this is a whole thing. Like, he's not just about to go heat up some water and <laughs> put some tea in. And uh, the, the meticulous preparation of the tea and her respect of his entire process and not just the taste of the tea, I just, I, I thought all of that worked really well. It was really effective. Like, I didn't even think we were I didn't think there was going to be a tea a tea scene. Like I just, again, I thought him just offering the tea was the point. So uh, when we get to what I thought was the end of the scene, and Buntaro is like, "Hey, guess what? I got a surprise for you. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna let you die tonight." I'm like, "Oh shit! She's got something to think about because I know she's loyal to Toranaga's mission, but she's been wanting to die for a long time." But then he says he's going to join her out of protest for Toronaga's surrender, a protest of, or to, I don't know the preposition that fits here. Uh, join her out of protest of, protest, yeah, protest of, of Toronaga's surrender. And she says he never, uh, this whole time, he's never been denying her death. He's been denying her a life outside of his grasp. And then says that she'd rather live a, <laughs> she'd rather live a thousand more years than die with him. <laughs> I said, God damn. Uh, although, if I'm being honest, that does feel a little bit, a little bit revisionist to me. Like, I feel like this whole time, the show has told us that she wants to die because of the shame associated with her family and her family name after what her father did. So it feels a little bit revisionist history for her to say that she wanted to die in order to escape Boomtaro. Like, yes, yeah, she wants to escape him. We know that. That's clear. But I never, I don't like to say I never, the show I don't think has either. Uh, ever connected that desire, the desire to leave Buntaro with her desire to die, uh, I, I, I just don't think that's been on the screen. The connection was between her death and the shame associated with her father killing the Tycho. Not, uh, I want to get away from Buntaro. That was just like a, it, at least to me, I feel like the show presented that as a, a, f a fringe benefit, you know? <laughs> uh, so I, I kind of gave that moment a brief side eye, making it sound like it was about him this whole time. I don't think that's been on the screen. But again, not a huge deal. Especially since we know that she actually does still want to get away from him. Then after that scathing comment, she just gets up and leaves. And then Butaro cries. And I'm just like, wow, they somehow successfully made this piece of shit vulnerable and sympathetic? Like, I, I mean, of course. I, I don't think if Butaro dies, anyone here is going to shed a tear. I mean, it's it's if they can pull that shit off, wow. But like... I'm not going to say he's sympathetic, but like, still, that's what they were going for. And I feel like it was, a, it was effective to make you feel like, damn, like, <laughs> you got to feel bad for him at that moment. You quickly remember that he's a piece of shit, but you feel bad in the moment. At least uh, I hope you do. Um, also at Edo, Blackthorn reunites with Father Martin. That's the guy that I said looks like Yuri Prohaska. If you're not a UFC fan, you're not going to know who that is. But if you are, he looks just like Yuri Prohaska. Uh, he reunites with Father Martin and they have a <laughs> this, like brief dick measuring contest in the street. <laughs> like, and I think Father Martin wins this when he says, uh, he asks Blackthorn if he's going to wear them same clothes <laughs> when he goes to reunite with his crew. <laughs> oh, ooh, sick burn, Father. <laughs> like, he ain't going to wear that. Uh, but he did, actually. Uh, so, uh, Father Martin then meets with Toronaga and suggests that Toronaga align with Lady Achiba. And this was a strange moment to me because it seems very obvious based on what's been said and what we've seen on the screen that Lady Achiba would have no interest in aligning with Toronaga. So why suggest it? She fucking hates him. Additionally, Hiramatsu says that Toronaga looks defeated and they have like this brief uh, back and forth about strategy as well. Like, we could do it this way, or if they come here, we can defend ourselves. Like, ultimately, Toronaga says that a win would be too costly, so he'd rather die in peace. However, 
he somehow knows about, well, somehow, but he knows about both the discourse surrounding his decision to surrender and about his generals uh, wearing armor to Nagakato's funeral. And he wants a loyalty oath signed by all his generals that say that they're loyal to him and thus will be surrendering with him uh, to Ishido. It's essentially like, hey, sign your name here saying you're willing to die with me. <laughs> That's essentially what this thing is. The ultimate loyalty test, right? Again, like, I, I don't understand why this episode title doesn't have to do with loyalty. Anyway, uh, he closes by telling Father Martin uh, he will still get his church in Edo, but that he must go to Osaka and report what he's seen there. Now, this triggered the same thought in me that it did in Hiramatsu. Although, again, in retrospect, it didn't trigger a thought in Hiramatsu. It, it, well, you, you get it. Uh, but my thought was like, if he doesn't have a plan, then what's he, what's he sending Father, Ma Father Martin to Osaka to talk about? What's he got to say? So Hiramatsu has the same thought, and he goes out, and he's not he, hes not sharing his thought. He's planting a seed. Uh, but he's like, yep, Tornaga definitely has a plan. Why else would he be sending Father Martin away? And I feel like in that moment, Hiramatsu, Toronaga, both know that sending Father Martin to Osaka is not for the purpose of him doing anything in Osaka. It's just so that Hiramatsu can go tell everyone else that Toronaga has a plan. And... Yeah, that, that's, that's what I believe. I, I believe that the we see clues about this plan very early in this episode. And I bet probably even earlier in the season as well. Uh, so Toronaga tells Father Martin to go to Osaka. Uh, Hiramatsu tells everyone else, crisis averted, he has a plan. Why else would he send Father Martin to Osaka? And we know how Yabushi is, <laughs> we know how his loyalty is set up. Oh, he has a plan? Uh, the safest place for me is here, Team Toronaga. So uh, when Blackthorn approaches Yabashiga trying to team up in a line against Toronaga, of course Yabashiga says no. Right now, he believes being aligned with Toronaga is the best move. He has no, It has nothing to do with loyalty. It's just about, oh, he has a plan, I'm going to stick with him. So when I said loyalty is a big theme in this episode, how many times have I said it in this video? Think about this conversation. Think about Mariko telling Blackthorn that loyalty has no expiration. And Blackthorn replying saying that loyalty looks pretty silly when the order is death. Uh, think about Omi expressing uh, his doubts to Kiku. Like, so much about loyalty in this episode. Uh, anyway, the order is death here, and we see how Yabashiga responds. He responds like Blackthor. Oh, if I if I stay loyal, I die? Then fuck it, I'm out. <laughs> oh, wait, we ain't dying no more? Now I'm loyal again. So, like, like I said, we see how Yabashiga set, uh, his loyalty is set up. Uh, so everybody arrives to sign this loyalty oath, and Yabashiga and Omi both surprise it, surprise, surprisingly sign it, uh, before the descent begins. And the descent is highlighted by Hiramatsu, saying that if, if Toranaga intends to uh, surrender and sentence them all to death, then he's going to kill himself right there, and he has his ask his son, remember, Butaro is his son, he, well, I mean, he says it in the, in the moment, but he asks his son to be his second. And again, when we're talking about the importance of those cultural scenes, that doesn't necessarily, like, that might have landed, that wouldn't have landed until Butaro did it, if we hadn't had the earlier, the scene, I think it was last week, where we learned about the second and the whole thing about Toronaga as a kid not being able to chop the head off all the way. Like, if we hadn't had that, we wouldn't have known what that was until Butaro did it. But as soon as he said, I want Butaro to be my second, I said, oh, shit, your own son? You want to do this? So, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, those things, those little those little cultural tidbits that we get, uh, they matter. And I think that that's, that's, that's the sign of a show that performs well. Uh, it thinks about the little things. I've talked about this a lot in other videos. Um, I can't remember what show it was that I mentioned before. Really strong show. And I was like, you know, but it, it, it's these little things that it misses. And those little things are the difference between a good show and a great one. And this one is getting the little things. Uh, so like I said, I've already talked about how well this show has explained uh, this culture's relationship with uh, death and suicide. Uh, but him asking his son to be a second, like I said, it lands a little bit better now, uh, now that we know what that means. Another thing I loved about this scene was the tears uh, in the eyes of both men. Not because I'm a sucker for uh, savviness, but because those tears said a lot more than just friends saying goodbye to one another. You know, I've talked about the culture a lot and what we've learned about how these people operate. And the hallmark of this show has been characters present themselves as emotionless in situations that are pretty emotional. You know, again, think about the tea scene early in the episode. Very dry, flat conversation that was completely packed to the gills with emotion. But outwardly, it was just kind of like monotone speaking. Uh, again, great, this is great work with, from this show here. Uh, but the emotion isn't conveyed via words or tears. It's conveyed via the preparation and the ritual on Butaro's end and the acceptance 
uh, of that tea and the compliment that Mariko gave. So like, that's where uh, we get that emotion. It's not, you know, spoken or shown. They, they, they do really good with showing it on their faces and then taking it back. Uh, Mariko, I think, does it. There's no I think. She does it in the tea scene when he proposes the death. So it struck me that in this conversation uh, between friends, uh, between Hiramatsu and Toronaga, where one friend is saying, I think you're so wrong that I'm going to kill myself. And the other friend is saying, fuck it then, do it. <laughs> like, it doesn't really seem like that's a situation where they would be crying. During this scene, more than ever, I was certain that Toronaga had a plan. Like, and that this conversation was part of that plan and their outward performance was betrayed by the tears. Like, it kind of spoiled the fact that there was a plan, which was revealed moments later, but the scene was so well done that I didn't even care and the fact that I ended up being right didn't lessen the scene for me. It, it was one of those scenes that, like, like in Succession, a lot of what was said wasn't verbal. You gotta read between the lines to get the true weight of that scene. But like I said, Toronaga had a plan, and this was part of it. Hiramatsu's role in that plan was to essentially draw out Yabashiga. Uh, Yabashiga's been back and forth, like I said, most recently loyal to Toronaga since Hiramatsu had him believing there was a plan. Um, this was confirmed when Yabashiga turned down Blackthorn's request to align. Now, in Yabashiga's mind, there's definitely no plan. He just allowed uh, Toronaga, that is, just allowed his right-hand man to kill himself over the surrender. If there was a plan, that was the time to reveal it, and he didn't do it. So in Yabashiga's mind, oh, nope, no plan. So of course, if there's no plan, Yagashiba now accepts Blackthorn's proposal of disloyalty. <laughs> a, a plan that everyone, when Blackthorn originally proposed it, said made Blackthorn a piece of shit. Like, we're going to forgive you for being a piece of shit right now. Uh, we also learned that Mariko plays a role in this plan, too. And I believe she's known her role and the true nature of Toronaga's plan just as long as Hiramatsu did. So we end the episode with her boarding Blackthorn's boat with Yabashiga's banner along with Yabashiga and Father Martin to head to Osaka and finish off this season with a bang. Now, uh, before I wrap up, I want to close with a couple of thoughts about a few other things that happened uh, in this episode. So uh, the, the deceased Taiko's widow dies in this episode. Remember, uh, Lady Achiba is just the woman that he made a baby with, not his wife. Uh, his wife is the woman who dies... Uh, in this episode, and her parting words are a recommendation to Lady Achiba to not align with Ishido. Interesting, since Ishido had proposed marriage as a strategic alliance earlier in the episode. Then after she dies, we see Achiba bowing to Ishido. Uh, no words are spoken, but that still read to me like she was accepting his proposal. Do you guys think that Achiba might have poisoned the Taiko's wife to kind of like get her like as the last piece off of the board and to help her uh, become an unrivaled power. Just, just food for thought. I, I I don't... I'm struggling with motive because I don't know what her end game would be, but all of this, it felt very intentional to me. I feel like o o Ochiba had something to do with this. Uh, we also learned that the manipulation of Toronaga's brother was her idea. Shido gives her props for that. Uh, Blackthorn is also briefly reunited with some of his crew in this episode. And now that he's a <laughs> he's a respectable Japanese man now, uh, he finds his crew's behavior to be uh, <laughs> barbaric. <laughs> this uh, that's what this is the word that they use. Uh, this puts him in a unique position of having no one to really align with. He, and he sees Yabashiga similar to him in that regard. But now this puts Blackthorn uh, firmly in opposition to Toronaga. So uh, I'm excited to see how that plays out. Lastly, I thought it was really funny. How the space for Father Martin's church is right next to the space for Lady Gin's little uh, brothel village. Uh, brothel, by the way, is the word that I was struggling to remember last week when I was referring to the business that she operates. Brothel was the word I was trying to remember. Uh, so on that note, another great episode. Two more left. I can't wait to see what happens next. Let me know what you thought in the comments. And until next week, peace.